uh, waiting for Kaggle on YouTube. Hmm. Says I'm live. Ooh. Uh, do I? Oh, wait, I see myself. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Um, hello. I'm sorry for uh, the sort of a little bit wonky, uh, let me make this a tiny bit wider, a little bit wonky audio quality today. I am on the road, so this is not my, my usual setup. But uh, I'm here, and we're going to keep reading the paper. A non-user says you're live. Thank you. Um, so last week, we got started with this paper, dissecting contextual word embeddings. It's really weird not to get myself on the monitor. Um, architecture and representation. And the sort of uh, main point of this paper is that they're arguing that contextual word embeddings um, contain information on uh, more than just the embeddings, Good morning, dear. Um, more than just sort of like semantic information that they include structural information at higher levels of the grammar. Um, let me see the, the specific place where they say it. Um, so starting with the morphology, the, the word, the meaning segments that make up words, uh, and then going through things like local syntax, so dependency structure, constituency structure, question mark. I don't know that they're going to commit to one of those um, particular ways of thinking about syntax. And then uh, finally, they're they're claiming that long range or longer range semantics like uh, co-reference or um, you know entity resolution sort of things information is is stored in the upper layers of the network. Uh, and this is a pretty bold claim. Uh, so I think I I round up uh, last uh, time saying that I was excited to see the. Uh, uh, evidence that they would present for this claim. Uh, hi, it's me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So last week we read through the introduction. We read through their sort of discussion of um, the work that they were doing. So they are um, uh, comparing different network architectures. So they were looking at um, LSTMs, CNNs, and then uh, transformers or self-attention networks. It's me says happy holidays, maybe? I don't know what holiday it is. It was St. Patrick's Day recently. Um, and they are working with bi-directional language models. So sort of similar to Elmo. Um, and they had their original paper used LSTMs, two LSTMs, one facing backwards, one facing forward. And then in the last layer of their model, taking the, um, uh, uh, whatchamacallum, uh, the information and, and, um, sort of like squashing it into, um, one output. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> um, so he says, oh, it's the Indian Color Festival, Holly. Oh, happy Holly. Um, and they're also using uh, character-based language models. So I believe that they were, yeah, so they were looking at two 2048 characters at a time. Um, uh, okay, oh, so first embeds single characters with an embedding layer and then passes them through 2048 character n-gram CNN filters with max pooling to highway layers. And we looked at that and that is um, information being passed directly from lower layers to higher layers without passing through the intermediate layers, um, I, I believe. Uh, and then the final linear projection down to the model dimension, um, which is fairly standard. Uh, and then the deep contextual word representations. Um, you're trying to see. So the ELMO, all layers combined with a weighted average pooling operation ELMO. So ELMO is this 
average pooling. And we spent some time last week um, working through through this equation. Um, I don't think we ever figured out what lambda was. I think it was the set of weights is what we we arrived at. Um, uh, and so they're using this normalization, this weighted weighted average pooling um, as the final layer in all of their models, I think is where they're going with this. Um, and they are going to look at the relative effectiveness of ELMO representations from three different BILM architectures, so bidirectional language model architectures, and then compare them to pre-trained word vectors um, across four different state-of-the-art models. Um, so pre-trained word vectors like GLOVE or fast text or word to vec or um, you know whatever you're using. All right, so I believe we ended there. Uh, and let's start in with section three. So one of the things they're doing in this paper is they're comparing these different architectures. Um, and section three is architectures for deep bidirectional language models. The primary design choice when training deep bidirectional language models for learning context vectors is the choice of the architecture for the contextual layers. However, it is unknown if the architecture choice is important for the quality of learned representations. Okay, so picking what type of what type of um, neural network you're going to use and, and what the, the setup is going to be, but we don't know the effect of architecture choice on um, the, the representations that are learned. To study this question, we consider two alternatives to LSTMs as described below. See the appendix for the hyperparameter details. Um, so the original paper, the ELMO paper, was with LSTMs. LSTM. Uh, LSTM stands for long short-term memory. Among the RNN variants, LSTMs have been shown to provide state-of-the-art performance for several benchmarked language modeling tasks. Understatement. Um, and then a bunch of citations. In particular, the LSTM with projection introduced by SAC et al. 2014. SAC et al.? S-A-K. Uh, allows the model to use a large hidden state while reducing the total number of parameters. This is the architecture adopted by Peters et al. 2018 for computing ELMO representations. In addition to the, in addition to the pre-trained two-layer BILM from that work, we also trained a deeper four-layer model to examine the impact of depth using the publicly available training code. To reduce the training time for this large four-layer model, we reduce the number of parameters in the character encoder by first projecting the character CNN filters down to the model dimensions before the two highway layers. Okay. So LSTM with projection allows the model to use a large hidden state while reducing the total number of parameters. Uh, I do not know what they mean by projection, but I'm guessing that's, I'm guessing that's what the, they're doing with the, um, the language model as well. So taking this high dimensional space and projecting it down into a lower dimensional space. Uh, so similar to, you know, PCA or other dimensionality, uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, let's just quickly look up LSTM with projection uh, and feel free to, to hop in if this is something that you are familiar with. Cora, what is the meaning of a projection layer in LSTM? Uh, a given LSTM unit will output its hidden states with number of units. To get this output layer, e.g. 10 units for 10 classes, you need a weight matrix of shape, number of units, output size. So you connect to the hidden state you connect your hidden state to the output layer via a projection layer. This layer doesn't have to be linear. You can treat your LSTM output as the input to a simple feedforward neural network with one hidden layer. So similar to softmax, um, sort of the, the final, uh, oops, <laughs> accidentally went down to the, uh, um, not a pendant. Bibliography, wow. I've only had one coffee this morning. I don't know about you guys, but I could definitely tell. Um, so they use the same, uh, the same architecture as SOC, I'm guessing, et al, for computing the ELMO representations. 
Um, and that was a two-layer bidirectional language model. And they also trained a four-layer model uh, because it does sound from their um, description of the work that they want at least a three-layer model to separate the morphology, local syntax, and long-range semantics that they're, they're claiming they found. Um, and they reduced the number of parameters in the character encoder by first projecting the CNN filters down to the model dimensions before the two highway layers. Okay, so instead of having a big square, they reduce that down to a smaller square that's the same size as the model dimension. Um, and then they insert that before the highway layers is what I'm getting there. And the highway layers are the things that would pass, let's say, you know, the first layer information to the third layer directly, if that sounds right. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm figuring this out as I go along, so uh, feel free to chime in if you, uh, you have uh, more experience with these particular, particular model architectures. Um, so it looks like they're using the CNN character encoder for all of their models, not just the CNN models, and that's the one that we talked about here, the character-based language models. Okay. So that's the LSTM, which is the same as their original. So Peters et al. is the, it's the same Peters on this paper and that paper. Uh, that's the Elmo paper. And they're doing the same model again, and then the same model, but deeper uh, to see if there's, there's an effective depth. And then transformers also, uh, I've heard these called self-attention networks, fully attentive networks, FAN. Um, I, I tend to call them transformers because that's what uh, Vaswani did. Um, and that's sort of what, I think in the machine learning research, that's a little bit more common. And in the NLP research, it tends to be, um, people tend to use other names. Uh, the Transformer introduced by Vaswani et al. 2017, which we've read on this channel, and you can go back and watch those, uh, is a feed-forward self-attention-based architecture. In addition to machine translation, it has also provided strong results for pen tree bank constituency parsing and semantic role labeling. Um, so constituency parsing is, uh, uh, I think I've, I've mentioned before, like figuring out which words that are close to each other form a unit and which words that are closer to each other don't. Um, so like, uh, I'm trying to come up with a good example sentence. Um, the dog is on the floor. On the floor is a, a sort of a, a trunk that goes together. Um, whereas dog is on is in some sense less, the words in that, in that chunk are less closely related to each other. Uh, and then semantic roles are things like agent, patient, instrument, uh, and those are uh, sort of deep, deep from the linguistics literature. Each identical layer in the encoder first computes a multi-headed attention between a given token and all other tokens in the history, then runs a position-wise feed-forward network. So that's what we've talked about uh, before. To adapt the transformer for bidirectional language modeling, we modified a PyTorch-based re-implementation, Klein et al. 2017, to mask our future tokens for the feed-forward language model and previous tokens for the backwards language model in a similar manner to the decoder masking in the original implementation. Okay, that is extremely interesting. So, Interesting. So bidirectional in this sense means two models, one facing in each direction. And the sort of like the fun thing or the exciting thing about the transformer is that you can, for any given token, consider all of their tokens in the past and in the future. And they're sort of creating two transformers, one that looks back, one that looks forward instead of um, one transformer that looks backwards and forwards at the same time. Uh, and they're also using this PyTorch re-implementation which I haven't looked at, but I know um, a lot of y'all are big PyTorch fans. So if you're if you're looking at transformers, that might be a good uh, good place to start. Uh, 
uh, in a similar manner to the decoder masking in the original implementation. Um, because in if you're doing machine translation and you can you know look at the translation, uh, it's uh, you know that's, that's a special form of leakage to just look at the answer and then say what it is. Uh, we adopted hyperparameters from the base, quote, configuration in Vaswani et al., so the smaller one, uh, providing six layers of 512 dimensional representations for each direction. Concurrent with our work, Radford et al. 2018 trained a large forward transformer language model and fine-tuned it for a variety of NLP tasks. Um, and I believe this is the BERT paper. Yeah? No, 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 because uh, that's not the first year author on the on the BERT paper. Okay, I think that must be the, um, is that the GPT-2 paper? When did this come out? Two, two, two. 2018. Okay, so it's definitely not the GPT-2 paper. Um, hmm. Bad for it at all. That sounds so familiar. Um. Maybe we've just, just read about it in, in other places as well. Maybe I read it like on my own at some point. I don't know. It sounds like a very uh, it sounds like a very familiar paper to me. Okay, so that was the transformer. Sort of an interesting architecture choice there that they made. Um, but I get that it's much more parallel to the other models because they, they have one forward, one backwards. Um, and the the Thing that they're really talking about is bi-directional language models. Um, I guess instead of one language model, that's all the directions. Okay, uh, and then gated CNN. Convolutional architectures have also been shown to provide competitive results for sequence modeling, including sequence-to-sequence -sequence machine translation. Garrick et al. 2017, Dauphin et al. 2017, showed that architectures using gated linear units, GLU, that compute hidden representations as the element-wise product of a convolution and a sigmoid gate provide perplexities comparable to large LSTMs on a large-scale language modeling tasks. Uh, Ryan says, have to go to the office, trying it as an audiobook. I hope it's a good audiobook. Uh, okay, and we, we talked about gated linear units, I believe, uh, that they're similar to the forget gates in um, LSTMs, but um, for a convolutional architecture, I think is, is what those are. Uh, I know we talked about these, and I think that's what I got out of that, talking about these. Uh, Element-wise product of a convolution, so sort of the, the output of the CNN, and then a sigmoid gate, um, so similar to the, the activation function, uh, and then the perplexities are comparable to large LSTMs on large-scale language modeling tasks. Um, and perplexity is a measure of language models. You want it to be low because that means when you see new data, you're not surprised by it. Uh, and it can can adopt well to to you know different uh, language input. To adopt the gated CNN for bidirectional language modeling, we closely followed the publicly available Com Seek to Seek implementation, modified to support causal convolutions. Vandenord twenty sixteen for both forward and backward directions. In order to model a wide receptive field at the top layer, we used a 16-layer deep model where each layer is a five, 4 uh, by 512 residual block. What is a causal convolution? Does that say causal or casual? I think that's causal. Tell me more. What are causal convolutions? Thank you, Cora. That is my question. Uh, the word causal comes from signal processing, in particular from the characterization of filters. Signals are functions of time and or space. Filters are functions that remove certain aspects of the signal, leaving only features that you are interested in, e.g. certain frequencies or positions of certain patterns. Linear filters are filters where, at each point in time or space, the output is determined by a weighted sum slash integral of the input, i.e. by a convolution. 
A filter is called causal if the filter output does not depend on future inputs. Oh, I see. So it's similar to the um, uh, the masking that they were doing in the transformer. So again, it's this this parallel structure where two models, one looking forward, one looking backwards. Okay. Um, I'm picking up what they're putting down. That makes sense to me. So it's sort of a really fair comparison between these these architectures so that no one architecture just has access to more information and that's why it does good. Uh, in order to model a wide receptive field at the top layer, we use a 16 deep layer, nope, 16 layer deep model where each layer is a four by 512 residual block. Um, and Kerr says, instead of space, you do convent time. Uh, and Ryan says, like WaveNet. Yeah, exactly like WaveNet is, is what I'm getting from this. Okay, so these are the model architectures that they're doing. And they also talked about pre-trained bidirectional language models. So um, also there's a lot of um, links in here to the uh, code it looks like that they're using for these different things, which is fantastic. Uh, and if you want the, the link to the paper, it should be in the video description. I should have said real quick that, yeah, I put it in the video description. Good job, Rachel. Uh, table one compares the bidirectional language models used in the remainder of this study. Okay, so they've trained them and now they're going to talk about them. All models were trained on the 1 billion word benchmark, Chalbot All 2014, using a sampled softmax with <laughs> 8,192 negative samples per batch. Overall, the averaged forward and backward perplexities are comparable across the models, with values ranging from 37.5 for the four-layer LSTM to 44.5 for the gated CNN, um, remembering that perplexities we want to be low. To our knowledge, this is the first time that the transformer has been shown to provide competitive results for language modeling. While it is possible to reduce perplexities for all models by scaling up, our goal is to compare representations across architectures for BLMs of approximately equal skill as measured by perplexity. So they're really trying to be very fair, give all of the models a fair shake. Um, and I am... Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy with the way they're setting up this, um, this particular, um, I'm happy with the way they're setting up this experiment. I'm happy with the sort of like controls they're introducing to make sure that one architecture doesn't have information, more access to more information. Um, yeah, so that's, that's pleasing to me. Uh, so far, I, I think this is good science. Uh, so here are uh, discussions of the, so here's a, a little summary of the performance of each of these language models. Um, oh, interesting. And they include inference time. Um, so how long it takes for it to generate um, um, sentences. Uh, so characteristics of the different BLMs in the study. For each model, the table shows the number of layers used for the contextual representations, uh, the average forward and backward perplexities on the one billion word benchmark, the number of parameters in bill, sorry, in millions, excluding softmax, so they don't use the, the sort of top layer, and the inference speed in milliseconds with the Titan X GPU for sentences with 20 tokens, excluding softmax. For the number of parameters and inference speeds, we list both the values for just the contextual layers and all layers needed to compute context vectors. For the number of parameters and inference speed, just the context layers and all layers needed to compute context vectors. Just the contextual layers would be... So this is without the language modeling and this is with the language modeling, I think is what I'm getting there. But I thought they used the same uh, character language model for all of them. Inference speed, including softmax. I guess the other thing that all of the layers could mean is including softmax, but they say that inference speed does not include softmax. Hmm, interesting. Okay, um, so sort of from... Uh, best to worst in terms of perplexity, which we want to be low. Um, it's the four layer LSTM, which is sort of the extension of their earlier model. Then the two layer LSTM, which is their the original Elmo model from um, the earlier Peters et al. paper. And then the transformer, and then finally the gated CNN. 
Um, and when we look at number of parameters in million, uh, the uh, four-layer LSTM has far and away the most parameters, uh, followed by uh, the two-layer LSTM and then the gated CNN, and then finally the transformer. So the transformer has fewer parameters and a uh, lower perplexity than gated CNN. But when we look at inference time, we can see that the LSTM, the four-layer LSTM, even though it had the... Um, the lowest perplexity takes the longest to actually um, do inference, followed by the two-layer LSTM, um, followed by the transformer, and mm, the transformer on one sentence, but the uh, gated CNN on 64 sentences, and then uh, that's those two are reversed, looking at one sentence versus 64 sentences. So if you want one sentence, the gated CNN is going to be the fastest. If you're doing 64 sentences, the transformer is going to be the fastest. Um, and so looking at all these things and sort of the trade-off, the one that if I were picking something to use, I would use is probably the transformer because um, it has you know good perplexity, not that many parameters, and fairly fast inference time. So if I cared a lot about inference time, I'd probably... Um, probably consider that, you know, to be a, a more useful model for me in particular. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, this is the first time Transformer has been shown to provide competitive results for language modeling. So it's definitely, so it looks like the, the sort of thing that would be good for CNN if you were interested in it would be if you had one sentence and you really cared about, you know, three milliseconds, which is not like that's not a span of time that humans are good at perceiving. <laughs> um, like, I'm trying to think like, at least in language, pretty much the fastest thing you can do is make a tap so that that, that sound in like ladder or atom, uh, and that usually takes around 20 milliseconds. Um, so not something I think that a human would necessarily notice if you're doing it sentence by sentence, but if you were doing like a lot of things, eventually it would add up, right? Okay, uh, the transformer and CNN-based models are faster than the LSTM-based ones for our hyperparameter choices, for our hyperparameter choices, with speedups of 3 to 5x for the contextual layers over the two-layer LSTM model. Speedups are relatively faster in the single element batch scenario where the sequential LSTM is the most disadvantaged, but are still 2.3 to 3 times for a 64 sentence batch. As the inference speed for the character-based word embeddings could be mostly eliminated in a production setting, the table lists timing for both the contextual layers and all layers of a BLM necessary to compute context vectors. We also note that the faster architectures will allow training to scale to large unlabeled corpora, which has been shown to improve the quality of BLM representations for syntactic tasks, Zhang and Bauman 2018. Zhang and Bauman 2018, that sounds so familiar. Uh, language modeling teaches you more than syn teaches you more syntax than translations do than translation does. Lessons learned through auxiliary tax task analysis. That sounds super familiar. I don't know if I've read it, but it's you. That's uh, that's definitely a paper title I have read before. Um, I don't know. At some point, papers start to <laughs> start to uh, blur together. At least for me. Okay, um, so they're saying that even though the perplexity on this task is better, the fact that it's the um, transformer and CNN are so much faster uh, might make them better eventually because you can you can do more more inference on a larger training data set, and there's evidence that that makes the results better. All right, evaluation is word representation. So this is the part of the paper that I'm really excited about. Uh, Oh, and a uh, quick footnote, while the CNN and transformer implementations are reasonably well optimized, the LSTM BLM is not, as it does not use an optimized CUDA kernel due to the use of the projection cell. I, I don't know what that means, but I think the general thing is the thing with RNNs where you need to um, know what's happening at time t minus 1 to predict what's happening at time t. I don't know what a projection cell is. Also, there's some like thumping next to the, in the wall next to me, not in the wall, but behind the wall next to me. And hopefully you guys can't hear that. Um, sounds like someone's like, I don't know, moving furniture or something. 
Uh, evaluation as word representations. In this section, we evaluate the quality of the pre-trained BLM re representations as Elmo-like contextual word vectors in state-of-the-art models across a suite of four benchmark NLP tasks. To do so, we ran a series of controlled trials by swapping out pre-trained glove vectors, Pennington et al. 2014, uh, for contextualized word vectors from each BLM computed by applying the learned weighted average Elmo, the learned, Weighted Average Elmo Pooling from Peters et al. 2018. So they're comp comparing the um, contextual vectors from Elmo uh, to Glove, which is uh, the pre-trained word vectors that are by Facebook? Is Glove Facebook's thing? No, Glove is um, Stanford, Stanford NLP's uh, particular uh, Oh, embeddings. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sorry. I'm forgetting words left and right here. Each task model only includes one type of pre-trained word representation, either glove or Elmo-like. This is a direct test of the transferability, transferability, transferability of the word representations. In addition, to isolate the general purpose LM representations from any task specific supervision, we did not fine tune the NL LM weights. So basically they're treating them like Legos. They're take, popping one out, popping the other one in, seeing what happens. Excuse me, <coughs> pardon me. Table two shows the results. Across all tasks, the LSTM architectures perform the best. All architectures improve significantly over the glove only baseline with relative improvements of 13 to 25 percent. Holy moly for most tasks and architectures. Wow, that's a big improvement. Um, the gains for multi NLI are more modest with relative improvements over glove ranging from 6 percent for the gated CNN to 13 percent for the four layer LSTM. The remainder of this section provides a description of the individual tasks and models with details in the appendix. Um, to put that in context, if I'm reviewing a paper and they're 5% over the baseline, I think that's an, exci an exciting result. Um, so this is, wow, that is a large improvement. Uh, let's look at the table. Uh, the table? Table three. Table two. Ah, there it is. Uh, table two, test set performance comparison using different pre-trained BLM architectures. The performance metric is accuracy for multi-NLI and F1 scores for other tasks. For multi-NLI, the table shows accuracy both on the matched and mismatched portions of the test set. So I think that's uh, natural language inference. And I think, I think we've talked about that before. It might be in the Blue, that sort of meta task that the BERT paper um, used. But let's look it up really quick. Let's see some examples. No, I want to search. Okay. Uh, there we go. Multi-gen, ooh, excuse me, let's make this much bigger. Yeah, we've looked at this exact page before on this channel. Multi-genre natural language inference corpus. Um, so we have a premise, we have a hypothesis, and given those two, we need to find the label, I believe. Um, so the labels are neutral, so the hypothesis and the premise don't have any relationship to each other, or they could contradict each other. Um, so the, the premise is, uh, yes, now you know if, if everybody, like in August, when everybody's on vacation or something, we can dress a little more casual or... And then the hypothesis is August is a blackout month for vacations in the company. Um, and you can see that they're saying in August, everybody's on vacation. Um, so these two things contradict each other. Um, and then an example of entailment, and this is um, logical entailment. These are, these are terms for, from formal logic, if you're not familiar with them. Um, at the end, at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, people began to line up for a White House tour. And if that is true, then it is also true that people formed a line at the end of Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, so those, those entail each other. Um, or, or rather, um, 
this entails this because this is a more general case. And it could be the case that people are forming a line at Pennsylvania Avenue, not for the White House tour. But given that people are forming a line at Pennsylvania Avenue for a White House tour, it is true that they are also forming a line. So like the, the classic example here is if I have three dogs, it is also true that I have two dogs. But if I have two dogs, it is not true that I have three dogs. That sort of thing. Ooh, giving me, giving me semantics flashbacks. Um, so it did less well at those tasks. Um, overall, they, they saw a, a smaller improvement. Um, yeah, 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 more, the gains in multi-NLI were the most modest. Uh, and then SRL, or oh, actually, are they going to talk about all of these? They are going to talk about all of these. We don't have to go do them now by ourselves. Um, SRL, we can see a uh, pretty big improvement over GLOVE. So I, I would consider GLOVE to be the baseline because lots of people use that in the past. Um, constituency parsing uh, and then named entity recognition. And I believe this was semantic role labeling because I just looked at the section heading. Uh, and the thing to see here is that numbers go up. But again, even though the LSTM performed better, it takes longer to do inference and there are, um, you can see more parameters, so it also takes longer to train. So it's sort of like, do you, do you want to train for longer uh, and do you care about, like, uh, which, are, which are you more concerned about, time or accuracy? All right. Um, multi natural language inference uh, and multi here being multi genre not multilingual so these are from different types of text so um, transcriptions of people talking on the telephone or government documents or letters um, not but they're all in english i believe uh, the multi-NLI dataset, Williams et al. 2018, contains crowdsourced textual entailment annotations across five diverse domains for training and an additional five domains for testing. Okay, so there's 10 genres in this data set and you train on five and then you test on a wider range. So you have to be able to generalize across genres. Our model is a re-implementation of the ESIM sequence model, Chen et al. 2017. It first uses a BIOSTM to encode the premise and hypothesis, then computes an attention matrix followed by a local inference layer, another BIOSTM inference com composition layer, and finally a pooling operation before the output layer. So they're using the same model architecture, and the only thing that's changing is what they're using is sort of like the input embeddings, whether it's GLOVE, the two-layer LSTM, the four-layer LSTM, the CNN, or the other one, CNN, <laughs> uh, the, the fourth one, uh, transformer. I think I didn't say transformer. Um, generally speaking, so this is a footnote from earlier that I forgot. Uh, we found adding pre-trained glove vectors in addition to the BLM representations provided a small improvement across tasks. That's really interesting. So if you use both GLOVE and one of their bidirectional language models as input to your model, they found improvement. I don't know how that would work architecture-wise. Um, maybe you, you pool across both of them. Um, yeah, also their language models were character-based and GLOVE is word-based. So I don't know how you would use both of them together in the same model. Um, but maybe they, they released code for that, possibly. Um, capital layer. Uh, with the two-layer LSTM ELMO representations, it is state-of-the-art for SNLI, uh, Peters et al. 2017. So this is their, their previous paper where they proposed ELMO. As shown in Table 2, the LSTMs perform the best, with the transformer accuracies 0.2 and 0.6 matched, mismatched, less than the two-layer LSTM. So, uh, so the LSTM was better at training on one genre, one set of genres, and then um, doing inference on another set of genres, um, and the transformer performed better when you were, you were working in the same set of genres. So that's interesting. That's that's not something I'd necessarily expect a priori, that um, LSTMs might be less resistant to genre effects. Um, yeah, 
Interesting. In addition, the contextual representations reduce to the matched mismatched performance differences, showing that BLMs can help mitigate domain effects. Um, so uh, what I've been calling um, genre differences or genre effects. The ESIM model with the four layer LSTM ELMO-like embeddings set a new state of the art for the task, exceeding the highest previously published result by 1.3% matched and 1.9% mismatch from Gong et al. 2018. Um, so again, they do better on, there's a bigger improvement in uh, mismatch. Uh, Jer says, my guess is that they are concatenating both embeddings in order to feed them into the model. Yeah, that would make sense. I guess I was imagining like um, rather than concatenating that they were sort of, oh, oh, so you mean, yes, yes, no, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm following the words that you are saying. So concatenating like, um, so taking the, the, the embedding vectors from GLOVE and the embedding vectors from one of the BLMs and like adding them to make one really long vector. Uh, for some reason, I was imagining them taking them and then putting them through like another Elmo layer to do um, uh, uh, an additional sort of weighted average. But I don't know what you would gain from that besides potentially um, uh, I guess maybe like a little bit of of normalization, I guess. Um, yeah, but I don't think there's any reason to project your your uh, embeddings down before you're going in unless you want to reduce your your parameter space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. That was uh, that was helpful. Uh, interesting. It's very interesting to me that the LSTMs are more robust to genre effects, which suggests to me that there might be more memorization going on in the. Um, in the CNNs and the transformer, um, where sort of word uh, activations are, are um, where words are being activated due to sort of co-occurrence in the same text, and they're not being forgotten as something that's not always super relevant. Because um, the the thing that makes LSTM special is that you have that that forget gate, and you can sort of, you know. Instead of increasing weight for things that are oops, excuse me, uh, increasing weight for things that are important, you can decrease weights for things that aren't important. Um, is my understanding of how they work, and it's been a minute since I took coursework on LSTMs. Sorry, little drink of water. Hopefully that didn't sound awful. I don't have a monitor, so who knows? Um, it might have sounded like being next to a horse that's just going to town on a trough. Ooh. Okay, so that was the so that was the multi-natural language inference, which is where they saw the smallest improvements, but they still saw pretty dramatic improvements um, and better cross-domain improvements. Um, the other tasks they did, they saw larger improvements in. So semantic role labeling. The onto notes 5.0 data set. Pardon et al. 2013 contains predicate argument annotations for a variety of types of text, including conversation logs, web text, excuse me, web data, and biblical extracts. For our model, we use a by LSTM from H et al. 2017, who modeled RSL, excuse me, SRL, semantic role labeling, as a bio tagging task. Okay, um, <laughs> I don't know what some of these are. Uh, I do know that people are looking into the, have been looking into the onto notes uh, data set for um, uh, co-reference resolution, specifically for the, um, the competition that we're running right now for the uh, gender bias in co-reference resolution thing. Um, that the, I think Google Research is putting on. Um, the one where if you win the competition, you have to write an ACL paper. Get to, you get to write an ACL paper. Um, uh, predicate argument annotation. So this, I'm assuming is a word level annotation of whether or not something exists in the predicate or the argument. Variety of types of text. Let's look into this a little bit more because this is something I'm not super familiar with and I've done um, semantic, oh, I don't know why it's so hard to 
left click with this trackpad. Excuse me, right click with this trackpad. There we go. Uh, because um, I've done quite a bit of semantic role labeling by hand, but I haven't, it's not a, a NLP task that I know that much about. Uh, sorry, that's a little bit small. Collaborative effort between BBN Technologies, University of Colorado, University of Pennsylvania, and University of Southern California Information Sciences Institute. Uh, the goal of the project is to annotate a large corpus consisting of various genres of text with three languages, English, Chinese, and Arabic. Okay, are they doing Chinese and Arabic in this paper? They do not say the word English anywhere in here. Are they just taking English word embeddings and applying them to Arabic? Surely not. Surely not. Right? Right? They're probably just doing English. Um, if that is the case, they should say that. Uh, it's one of my um, one of my professors in grad school's biggest pet peeves is when people don't say what language they're working on and just assume that you know it's English, of course. Nobody speaks any language other than English. Um, that, that was sarcasm. Many people speak languages other than English, and it's important that we consider them in our NLP work. All right. Um, please view these samples. I would love to view these samples. Okay. Oh, so it's it's full on parsing. I see. Um, with uh, it looks like a little bit of sense disambiguation as well. Interesting. Um, so here is a plain sentence. I ground the rye on number six. Click out of eight in my champion juice grinder. Uh, I don't remember what LRB is. Left something boundary, right something boundary. Uh, out of eight. Now on number six, click on my championship grinder. So here is um, a parsed tree. And I've been, whenever I talk about um, consistency structure, I've been avoiding talking about trees. Um, so this shows the relationship between various words. Um, so you can see that the sentence is made up of a verb phrase and... Uh, okay, yeah, so it's made up of a verb phrase, which contains a noun phrase, a predicate phrase that is MNR. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what that would be. Uh, and then another predicate phrase that's uh, locative. So this is where it's taking place. Um, manner, maybe? Like how they're doing it? Yeah, MNR is probably manner. So a predicate phrase that is manner, a predicate phrase that is locative, so how they're doing it, where they're doing it, and then those are modifying the verb, um, and also the noun phrase is underneath the verb phrase, which is, I think, pretty standard. I know that in minimalism, minimalist syntax, that is the way that they do it, I feel like in X-Bar, which is another school of syntax, which is like old school, like old school, they had a sentence was made up of a verb phrase and a noun phrase. Anyway, so there's a full on constituency tree. Uh, okay, so and then LRB and RRB are in here. Left, right boundary, right? Okay, I have no idea what this LRB, RRB stuff is, and I don't really know what their task is still. Um, pen prop bank. Da, 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 da. Semantic representation includes word sense disambiguation for nouns and verbs with some word sense connected to an ontology and co-reference. So it's got information on sort of like what uh, pronouns are referring to and what in the sentence they're referring to. Uh, it's got information on um, if a word can be 
if a word with the same surface form can have multiple meanings. So I think I, I mentioned like bank, like go to the bank to put your money in it or go to the river bank to sit on it um, and helping to disambiguate, which those include. Uh, and they only do that for nouns and verbs. And then they also have an ontology, which is a thing that I've heard before. <laughs> it's a word I've, I've seen. Um, uh, tell me about ontologies, Google. Uh, the branch of metaphysics de dealing with the nature of being, uh, physi philosophical study of being, of being. Wow. More broadly, it studies contexts, concepts that directly relate to being, in particular, becoming, existence, reality, as well as basic categories of being in their relationships. Okay, so it's probably like a. Uh, Sort of like a semantic web that like Barack Obama is a type of president, which is a type of occupation, which is a type of person, which is a type of, you know, entity with agency or something like that. Um, okay. And then the task is conversation logs. Um, so... They're doing semantic role labeling. So I believe they are doing the things like determining. Mm, 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 mm. Where was that example that we were looking at? So I believe that the things that they are labeling are things that this. Um, uh, oh. Oh my gosh, preposition phrase um, it has information on manner, and this preposition phrase has information on location. Um, and maybe that this preposition phrase is the um, patient, so it's receiving the grinding action. Sorry, this noun phrase is the patient, although that doesn't seem to be labeled. Um, and that this. Um, noun phrase, the word I is the agent, which again does not seem to be labeled. Um, so I guess that's what they're doing. Um, but the point is that they do it real good. Um, so for this task, the LSTM based word representations perform the best with absolute improvements of 0.6% uh, of the four layer LSTM over the transformer and CNN. So looking at that, we can see that uh, all of the bidirectional language models, these context embeddings improve performance over GLOVE, um, which is, I believe, based on bag of words, and that um, the four-layer LSTM performed the best. Um, and we've got about seven minutes, uh, and I'm, I'm doing this in a conference room, and I will get kicked out at 10 exactly, so I want to make sure I'm not in the middle of something when that happens. Um, so let's actually really quickly look at the, um, let's really quickly look at glove. So the thing that they're saying is A, as they've previously, previously established, bidirectional language models, these context embeddings, so information not only on the word that it occurs with, but where it occurs in relationship to those other words, are performing better than bag of word embeddings like glove. And I'm going to make sure that that is what that is, glove. Bag of words. Nope. Uh, um, Co-occurrence information, how frequently they appear together in large text corpus, whereas GLOVE is a count-based model. Count-based models learn their vectors by essentially doing dimensionality reduction on the co-occurrence counts metrics. Yes, matrix. Can I trust this person? Uh, he's the creator of um, multilingual version of word to vec and has a PhD in computational linguistics and machine learning from Lethbridge. Uh, okay, that seems like a reliable resource. So the way that Glove works that I really wanted to quickly uh, check in on is you create a co-occurrence matrix. So for, um, let's see, we were doing it at the sentence level. So we'd create, I'm trying to find a short sentence that we can use. Okay, so we do, we create a sentence like something like this. So table two shows the results. Um, if we only had a lexicon of five, table two shows and the results, um, we'd create, you know, 
a row for each word, a column for each word, and then every time the words show up together in the same span of text, we'd um, add one, basically. So if words tend to show up a lot, so like if we had a larger corpus and we saw the results, um, or results and the occurring in the same sentence, we'd sort of like iterate that, that count every time. Um, and then at the end, you're going to have a really big sparse matrix because maybe uh, results and across never occur together. So that's going to be zero and also results and all never occur together. So that's going to be zero. So instead of having a matrix where the X and the Y dimensions are both the size of your lexicon, which is probably going to be pretty big because there's, you know, even in a smallish corpus, you're going to have a lot of different individual words that show up. You take that and you project it down into a smaller um, matrix. So you take a large space matrix and you project it down to a not so sparse, much smaller matrix. Um, so like GLOV 500 is like each word is a vector of 500, GLOV 200, each word has a vector of 200 that contains this sort of information on co-occurrence um, in a, in a 200-dimensional space instead of a, you know, 100,000-dimensional space uh, like you might get if you were, if you were doing a, a large corpus of English and you had each um, word as its own dimension. Um, the thing about that is that it has information on co-occurrence within the spans that you're looking at, so whether that's, you know, a sentence, a paragraph, a a text, or, or even it wouldn't make sense to do it the corpus itself. Um, but within each each span of text you're looking at, um, but it doesn't have information about where the words occur with relation to each other. So um, you're much more likely to see the results than results the in a corpus of English, um, because results is a noun and the is a uh, determiner or an article, and articles come in front of nouns, not after nouns, um, unless there's another noun after them. Like, you never end a sentence with the, right? Um, so, glove doesn't have that information, and these bi-directional language models do. They have, you know, they have seen words in their context, and they are storing that information for later. Um, and the, the sort of the point of the this table is that um, regardless of what architecture you use to train these language models that have information uh, not only on what words occur together, but where they occur um, with relation to each other, you see just like an improvement overall tasks. Um, and that the improvement is largest in, in most tasks with this four layer LSTM, which is an extension of their earlier Elmo model. And it is smaller with the transformer and the, um, the gated CNN, but you still see an improvement. So sort of this, uh, this table is telling me that if you, if you care about accuracy, um, you are probably going to want to include context information in your embeddings and not just use the glove word to vec sort of bag of bag of words model that doesn't consider where words are recurring in relation to each other. So that's what I've gotten out of that so far. Um, and we've read up to here. So we haven't talked about constituency parsing yet. Um, and we haven't talked about named entity recognition. Uh, and hmm, I don't know if it's going to be another one or another two weeks on this, but definitely at least one more week on this, uh, on this paper. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. I, uh, this was, um, uh, a paper that was recommended for the reading group by, oh, I feel really bad. <laughs> Someone whose name I have momentarily forgotten. Uh, but I've really been enjoying it. I feel like I'm learning a lot. Um, and I am, I'm slowly coming around to the idea that, that context embeddings uh, may be a good way of capturing um, syntactic information and potentially semantic information. I mean, the, the idea about embeddings is they're supposed to capture something about meaning. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, to finishing this paper. So far, I've been really impressed um, with the, the sort of attention to detail um, and the variety of tasks. I do want to know what languages they did semantic role labeling on, though. That is a, a big old question mark for me. All right, I'm about to get kicked out of my room. So thank you so much for joining me today, guys. Uh, sorry about the sound quality. I know it's probably not the best. Uh, I will be back on Friday at my usual time, 4 p.m. Pacific. We're going to do some live coding. I don't know what we're going to do yet. Um, if you've got recommendations, feel free to, to hit me up on Twitter or um, 
yeah, Twitter's probably easiest. Um, and I will talk to you guys on Friday or next Wednesday. Um, next Wednesday definitely will not be at the same time. I will announce what time it will be. It might be um, 9 central because that's the time zone that I'm going to be in. Um, and I will, I will let you know. All right. Thanks for joining, everybody. Um, I will see you on Friday or next Wednesday. Bye-bye.